Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. How was your trip? Not too good. Things are a little fraught on the mainland at the moment, as you can imagine. I think you'll find our security response has been appropriate. No problem with family compliance on that. I understand the ambassador's eldest son is less than amenable. Nate? He's moved into the residence. It's not an issue. Sent down, wasn't he, from Trinity? Yes. Hmm. A distraction our Mrs. Smith could well do without. Not to mention the younger son. Sam's no problem. Thirteen year olds are always a problem, worse than infants. I have to say, I'm of the view that two into one simply doesn't go. Sorry? The roles. Ambassador and mother. A lot of fathers seem to manage. Yes, but men always contrive to be detached about it. Women are invariably mothers first, ambassadors second. Why they're appointed to such security-sensitive areas as this is beyond me. Talent? <laughs> Excuse me, Ambassador. John, how long are these roadworks going on? Uh, all week, I'm afraid. They have been cleared. This is Dr. Smilburn, and I'm How do you do? How do you do? Rather surprising our paths have never crossed before, Ambassador. I presume you're here because of the increased security status. Actually, Ambassador, we would like your help regarding one of your distinguished predecessors here in Dublin, Sir Robert Beecham. Robert? I believe he was not only your mentor in your early career, but is also a personal friend. Yes, though I haven't seen that much of him since he retired. That presumably has been his choice, not yours, the lack of contact. Well, he prefers his own company, and I respect that. You know his circumstances, then? Living in a shack in the wilds of Wicklow? Oh. I understood it to be a rather pleasant house on the shores of a lake. Whatever. When not communing with nature, Sir Robert has been whiling away his sunset hours in writing his memoirs. Really? Well, that should prove interesting reading. He's led a very colourful life. Let me be frank, Ambassador. There is grave concern as to what those memoirs will actually contain. During his diplomatic career, Sir Robert was privy to much sensitive information. Our own official inquiries of him have been rebuffed. We strongly feel that publication would not be in the national interest. A legal injunction would be very difficult to secure here in Ireland and also very public. Therefore, a different approach is required. Now you, as his protege, have quite rightly always been held in the very highest regard by Sir Robert. You, above all people, are likely to be able to bring him to his senses. To be blunt, we would like you to dissuade Sir Robert from publishing. Believe me, Ambassador, Sir Robert has it in his power to do great harm. Get the book from him. I'll visit him. I won't promise you any more than that. Champagne, I'm afraid. I can offer you lunch. Carry on, Mr. 
Mr. Nolan. Thank you. Okay. Well, basically, these are the individuals known to be in Dublin at present who could pose a threat. Some of them will be already known to you. All of them are being watched. And these? Now, we've also done a trawl of press coverage and videotape. See if there's any faces that crop up more than once within range of the ambassador. These are they. Could all be totally harmless, of course. But they might not be. We are tracing each one and checking them out. However, because none of them is known to us, that's going to take quite a while. And obviously, the known terrorists have to be our prime concern. And I have to say, John, I'm not very happy that the Ambassador has seen fit to dodge off to the mountains at this juncture. Out of my hands. Sadly, can't get out and about as much as I would want. Um, I absolutely love it here. Um, I've been to places all over the world, as you can imagine, in this job, um, and experienced all kinds of receptions. But I have to say that the welcome I've had here in Dublin surpasses anything else. And I know that sounds like a cliche, but in this case, it's absolutely true. But I can't get out and about as much as I want. It all started, more or less, with retirement. Elaine dying. Yes, I know, Robert. I was so sorry about Elaine. I, I did try to contact you, but then I just wrote. Oh, thank you. Sorry if I never replied. It was a bad time. I got my own diagnosis immediately afterwards. I've got cancer. Oh, right. I should have gone by now, actually. They gave me 12 months. Oh, you've got to die of something. It does focus the mind, having mortality ringed on the calendar. All in all, a re-evaluation seemed to be in order. I've served my country. I've done my duty, but by definition that duty often infers moral compromise, economy with the truth, even outright denial of it. Whereas now you feel the truth is everything. What I feel is an overwhelming need to atone for my past sins of omission and acquiescence by, yes, if you like, setting the truth free. No more secrets, no more lies. Tell it like it really was. My conscience nags me with a forthright question, Harriet. What end did all my 40 years of diplomacy actually achieve? Is the world a better place? Surely our job is to make sure that it isn't a worse place. I see no evidence of having achieved that limited objective. Have you? Do you feel you actually exert some moral influence on events which you're caught up with? Yes, I do. I thought I did. It was a delusion. And that's why you're writing your memoirs. That's why I'm writing my memoirs. And that, of course, is why you're here. But like I said, Harriet, I'm perfectly sane. Who sent you? Nobody sent me. The ambassador may not succeed, you know. She may not even want to succeed. I'm sure she knows where her duty lies. And if she comes back empty-handed? We always have our fallback position. Aggravated persuasion. Against Beecham? I am charged with finding out what is in that bloody book. There will not be another spy catcher fiasco. Just don't underestimate the ambassador. She's her own person. She's her country's person. That's why she's here. Doesn't it worry you that the national interest is in the hands of an odious reptile like Milburn? I never said I liked him. Hmm. Anyway, personality isn't an issue. But the national interest 
can hardly be lightly dismissed, can it? What is the national interest? Suppression at all costs? I don't make that equation. Mm. Robert? Would it be unreasonable to remind you that you did sign the Official Secrets Act? No, it would be perfectly reasonable. I'm afraid my conscience has already wrestled with that particular sheet of government paper and consigned it to the waste bin. I'm a spent force, Harriet. I've only got one shot left in the locker, the truth, and I'm determined to fire it. Robert. I've always found you to be an honourable man, and I still do. And I hope that I can still recognise a principle worth fighting for. But is this really the one? Never having read the book, you're hardly in a position to judge, are you? No, I'm not. Hmm. Well, and why don't we remedy that? Um, uh, take chapter seven. Uh, don't read it now. I don't want you influenced in any way. Take it away with you. Consider it properly. And then tell me honestly whose interest is best served by suppression. I trust your integrity, Harriet. I'll honour your decision. Ambassador? Yes. Well, how do you define serious? Treating it as more than just horizontal jogging? Oh, Jennifer, look. Well, just I... find someone else to exercise with. Oh, I'm sorry, Ambassador. Did you need me? No. John, I need to talk to you. Yes, sure. <clears throat> Did it work out with Sir Robert? No. He did give me one chapter to read, which I've done. John, what will Melbourne do if I don't deliver? What can he do? How well do you know him? Hardly any better than you do. Why? This chapter accuses him. It refers to a period during the mid-80s when he was counter-espionage controller in Northern Ireland. And according to Beecham, Melbourne took the view that if too many IRA attacks were foiled by inside information, suspicion would be aroused. So Melbourne decided which IRA targets were to be saved and which were not. Amongst those on the hit list was an RUC officer from Armagh. Melbourne allowed this man and his entire family including three children under the age of five, to be blown to pieces by a car bomb. What do you want me to say? Well, for a start, is it likely to be true? There was such a car bomb incident. Milburn was operational controller in Ulster at the time. And Beecham had been seconded to the Northern Ireland office, so... Yes. He could conceivably have known something about MI6 strategy. Strategy? What kind of strategy is it that consigns three children to their death? And what's achieved by it, anyway? Look, even if this is true, even if it's the whole story, who can possibly benefit from its publication now? I understand your reaction, Harry. Don't patronise me, John. Are they never to be accountable? Perhaps that's something you should ask Milburn. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry to put you on the spot. I should have realised how firmly you were wearing your MI6 cap. Thank you, John.
still be going to school, though. Ah, well, now, that's the good news. You won't. Will they have to send my prize home as well? What prize? It's a prize going tomorrow night. I've won one. I only got told this morning. Best progress in first term. That's brilliant, Sam. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I was going to when you started about the new security rules. Sorry. Look, you don't have to worry about all this. No, thanks. It's only for a few days, a couple of weeks at the most. Then things will be back to normal, OK? Sure? Yep. Mum. Mm -hmm. You know when Dad died? Yeah. Well, weren't the security people any good? Th that was different then. That was Beirut. This is Dublin. It never happened here. Not these days. Want to come outside later? Meet the actors. What sort of actors? Oh, theatre, stage, British Council tour. What, like Shakespeare? Yeah, that sort of thing. I'll watch TV, thanks. Ambassador, I appreciate your hospitality. Thank you. Though, before we go down, might I inquire how the day went? Yes, I saw Robert, and he explained to me why he wants to make certain facts public, and having read a chapter of his book... He I... gave you a chapter? Yes, in confidence. May I read it? I think that would be a betrayal of trust. Ambassador, I hardly need remind you that if there is any betrayal of trust, that it is Sir Robert who is guilty of it. Only if he publishes. This is not a game. And I need hardly remind you that I do not take orders from MI6. All right, Bex? Yeah, I hope so. Oh, just through there. Cora? Oh, lovely to see you. Excuse me. I haven't seen you since that wonderful Gert food last time. Oh, I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed it. So, what are you doing? What are Excuse me, Your Excellency. Can I offer you some more champagne? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thank you. I must say, when I was at school... I An orange the juice, then. Um, oh, all right, then. Thank you. You're very welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Cora, can you excuse me a moment? Sir, just go ahead. Hi, Marcus Dugdale. You from the Abbey or the Gate? I'm sorry? Local theatre? I'm with this lot, doing sound bites of Old England for you tomorrow. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars. Great speech. Do it all over the world. Could offend a few natives, I suppose, but what the hell? It's art. I'm sorry, would you excuse me? Yes, of course. Uh, see you at Powers Court tomorrow. Very good luck. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who's your new friend? Oh, sorry, sorry. He <laughs> bores for <laughs> England. You should go and up with Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Evening, Buster. Ah! stuff, you know, Sam. I tell you what, you and I are going to have a real boys' weekend. There's loads of sport on TV. And in between, you can help me with my revision. Sound okay to you? Do you want me to stay with him? No, it's all right. Thanks. You're turning him into a nervous wreck. He shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. Doesn't it ever occur to you that even I'm scared you'll end up like that? No. I didn't realise. <sighs> Mum, I do not want both my parents blown to bits. 
And for what? Job satisfaction? Surrounded by spooks and heavies? You're just a glorified prisoner. What can I do? Run away? Look, Nate, I know what you're saying, and I love you for it. But it's not possible. But what would help me enormously, and Sam, is if you could try to accept Dad's death. I, I, I don't mean forget him, just the opposite. But somehow try to put something positive in the gap. You mean grow up? No. We all have to change. I have to live with it. Sam needs someone to look up to. Not a subversive brother. And I... I, I would love to have someone to talk to properly rather than constantly having to justify myself. I thought you'd all gone. Just going now, miss. Good night. Ah, good morning, Ambassador. I trust I wasn't too sorely missed in the latter part of the evening. I'm afraid Ernest Thespians bring out the antisocial in me. Robert Beecham's manuscript is missing. It was in my bag, in my bedroom, and the bag is no longer there. Perhaps you've mislaid it. No, I haven't mislaid it. Someone has taken it. Ambassador, please, you're surely not implying that I would burgle a lady's bedroom. You were not able to obtain the manuscript yourself, and you knew that I had a chapter. The suggestion is outrageous. I deny it categorically. Is that an MI6 denial? Anyone could have taken the damn thing if you simply left it lying around. I did not leave it lying around. Well, from what you've said, it certainly wasn't locked away. Do you realise the possible consequences of your carelessness if the manuscript falls into the wrong hands? I suppose your worst-case scenario would be publication. But whether you're so exercised on behalf of the national interest or your own, I'm no longer sure. What do you mean by that? You know very well what I mean. Ambassador, I wonder if I might have a moment of your time? There's something I think you should know. What? Beecham's wife the late and uh, beloved Elaine, left him for a few months back when he was doing his stint at the Northern Ireland office. So? She left him to have an affair, which casts rather a different light on Beecham's motives for exposing Milburn. Why? It was Milburn she was having the affair with. What? Harriet, back so soon? <laughs> I hope I get as quick a response from my publisher. Well, what do you think? I was shocked and angry. Good. And stupidly careless. The manuscript's been stolen. By Melbourne. I'd expect no less of him. Uh, MI6 will stop at nothing. That's the whole point of the book. Well, if I lost a chapter, I can easily rewrite it. Robert, I want to ask you something. I've been told that when you were at the Northern Ireland office ten years ago, Elaine... I had a fling with Milburn. Have you got this from him? No, no, no. no it's perfectly true. 
Although I must admit, I thought no one else knew except the three of us. It lasted three months. Very discreet, very secret in the best traditions of the service. And I was very dignified and proper when I found out. Elaine apologized, explained, and never saw him again. I mean, she wasn't in love with him. I can quite understand how it happened. I mean, she was younger than me, as you know, and I was getting a bit remote. Northern Ireland was extremely stressful. My idea of making love was to read Arabic poetry aloud. Milburn speaks Arabic too, but not in bed, as far as I know. Harry, this book is not about my personal life, it's about public life. The fact that Milburn had a, a brief affair with uh, Elaine is irrelevant. It's not in the book. Yes, I know I understand that. Well, you should also understand that I'm not seeking revenge. I'm not out for the money. And I'm certainly not using you to achieve that. Robert, you may not be using me, but you're placing me in a very difficult position. If, if you trust my motive and you share my anger and revulsion, we're allies. Allies? I thought you wanted an impartial decision. Well, then make it. Uh, the book's almost complete. It has to be published. Oh, Ambassador, hmm? can I just show you the alterations John Stone's been making to your diary? What alterations? Well, you know, weeding out expendable engagements due to the new security status. We've been advised... No, no, I've to... already talked to Special Branch about this, and it's the expendable engagements that I want to keep. Look, you haven't cancelled this afternoon, have you? British Council performance? Well, um, no, not exactly, but he did rather assume that you wouldn't be going. Well, I am, and, and tonight, look, the school, it's, it's Sam's prize giving. Any messages? Just one from Douglas Milburn. He's waiting at the residency. Ambassador, would I be disappointed in hoping you've returned with the rest of Beecham's book? Yes, you would. Are you afraid that Robert's memoirs might reveal that you had an affair with his wife? Do they? No. You don't deny it, then? No. Does Beecham? No. Well, at least he and I agree on something. Ambassador, do you really assume that I am engaged in some personally motivated cover-up? Maybe then it's a professional rather than a personal revelation that you're afraid of. The missing chapter is about you. It describes how you decide who will live and who will die in the war against terrorism. It also suggests that those who are deemed expendable should at least have the right to know that someone is playing God with their lives. And it names you. The example quoted is the Stapleton family. The car bomb in Omar. Now, you may call me sentimental and naive, to consider even for a second Robert's point of view. No, Ambassador, your commitment to the truth is commendable, as is your personal loyalty to an old friend. Clearly, we underestimated both. Beecham is quite right. Decisions, choices are made. Moral choices, appalling choices. And yes, they're made in secret. They have to be, as you must know. The war against terrorism is not a cliché, it's a fact. And in fighting it, one must be as ruthless as the terrorists themselves. Fight fire with fire or be consumed. But one principle is cardinal, the greater good. What I do, I do for my country, and my country, your country, Ambassador, is a hypocrite. Society expects to be protected from terror it expects somebody to do its dirty work, but it is disgusted by those who do it. And that's your excuse? You personally signed the death warrant of an entire family. Five innocent people died. The father, the RUC officer, was always an IRA target. He knew that. 
And therefore there was always a risk that his family would be in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's not a risk. They were sacrificed. Yes, they were sacrificed. But that bald truth takes no account of what might have been weighing on the other side of the scales. Our informant was close to the decision-making process in his area. Using his intelligence, we had prevented many killings. But every tip-off was a dire risk both to him and to our capability. We didn't dare arouse suspicion further, especially as he knew that a major IRA offensive was being planned. In the event, tragically, five people died in that car. But consequently, we were able to save a hundred, possibly several hundred, soon afterwards from a bomb intended for a shopping precinct in Liverpool. My decision. And so if that is playing God, then that is what I did. What would you have done in my place? I don't know. breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat oh, defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, from the theatre of Shakespeare to another performing art flourishing in the late 16th century, the madrigal, which may be described as the unaccompanied singing of poetry. A madrigal was set in five or six parts, the poem itself consisting of not more than 12 lines, and being almost invariably of a pastoral or amorous nature. Martin, I think this is beyond the call of duty. If you don't mind, Ambassador. Yes, I do mind. Okay. Hello, Mr. Smith. Good afternoon. You can't imagine how much I've looked forward to this moment. I was afraid you wouldn't be here today. Someone said there was a security alert. Yes, there is. Not that I don't want you to take care. I do. I'm scared for you. There's so many dangerous people about. Wicked people. You don't recognize me. No. I was at your home last night. I waited on you. I'd hoped to speak to you then, properly, I mean, in private, just like this. I found your bedroom after the reception, but you didn't come. I knew it was your bedroom, though. I could smell your perfume. I sat on your bed. And I found this. I shouldn't have taken it. I I'm terribly sorry. Oh, you won't find anything missing. I haven't even opened it. Oh, no. That would be a gross violation. I took it because I wanted to show how easy it is to get close to you. Too easy. They don't take good enough care of you. Uh, and that makes me angry. Because you see, Mrs. Smith, I admire you deeply. 
have done ever since you set foot in Ireland. I've followed your progress every step of the way. Watched every TV program, read every article. By the way, my name's Tony, Tony Staples. I'm very concerned that... You okay? On your face, spread your arm. Get that bag out of here, get him out of here. This Staples character has been running rings around us, Michael. I mean, you've had these photographs since yesterday. And we were following that up, like I told you. But we have to prioritise John. He wasn't known. He could have killed the ambassador, for God's sake. But he didn't. And he was never going to try. He's a loony, Mr Nolan. How many other loonies have you overlooked? With respect, sir, they don't go around with labels on their foreheads. So you prioritise. But that should hardly be at the expense of looking beyond the obvious, should it? For example, the ambassador comes across as rather pro-Irish in her public pronouncements. Wouldn't you say, John? Perhaps a little too pro-Irish for some tastes. Were well, you saying there could be a loyalist threat to her as well as a Republican? I would like to hear your view on that. Come along, John. Mr. Nolan can't fight the war single-handed. Or perhaps he and his men are so good at it that you've become a little complacent. Your role as commercial attaché here is only a cover, you know. I am aware of that. Good. So let's not give the IRA all the credit. What about the UDA here in Dublin? Is there a presence? There are UDA people here, yes. How would you keep tabs on them? Name two. I'm sorry? Name two. Well, there's a few that we know of. Um... Thomas Dorley, James... Quinlan. Quinlan. Here under orders or splinter groups of one? Lunars, we believe. But dormant. Yes. Right, gentlemen. Let's see what they're up to before they become undormant. Pull them. You want me to... Yes, John, I want you out of that little computer den of yours. Find these men. He was found by the lake, unconscious, and he's asked to see you. as well. It's all done. I brought it with me just in case. Robert, the book doesn't matter just at this moment. Of course it matters. The only thing it does matter now. We both know that. <laughs> I shan't be walking out of this place. Melbourne being at you again, is he? We've talked. What picture did he paint of me this time, eh? He didn't paint any picture of you. So I did. Silly batty old man. No stake in the future. Behaving with the irresponsibility of imminent death. You're not doing that. No. You understand. You've been my lifeline, Harriet, these last couple of days. My inspiration. I don't think I could have physically finished the book. Not in time. Not without knowing that you were there. Waiting to see it through and carry on. I've never said that, Robert. It's such a fine and easy thing, the truth. Why? Do we ever lose sight of it? Take the book now. I don't suppose you've ever been bequeathed a conscience before. I know you'll take good care of it. Robert. 
but I love you dearly, and I'm sorry if I've given you reason to hope, to believe, but I, I just can't do this for you. I, I can't. I may be your friend, but I'm not your ally. Dorley's in Cork. Quinlan's got himself a lock up there. Is he dead? Yes, he is. I'm sorry. Are you? He was a fine man in some ways. I don't think you're the person to write his obituary. No. Did Sir Robert give you the book? Yes, he did. Well, whatever his qualities, now that he's dead, any sense of loyalty to him becomes redundant. Surely? Give my indecent haste. You need time to reflect. Shall we say half an hour? I'll be waiting in my car. Photo of Milburn. A real traffic cone freak here. The bloody roadworks. What prize are you getting, Sam? Well, you had to choose a book, so I've chosen Jack Charlton's autobiography. Stay where you are. Don't leave the embassy. The target's Milburn.
Seems the bomber had some connection to the RUC officer's family. He was out for revenge. After ten years? It was ten years to a fanatic. Oddly enough, I think Milburn would have understood. So what do you do now? Do? Well, it boils down to a straight choice, doesn't it? Hand the manuscript to Beecham's publisher or... Give it to MI6 to pick over. Actually, John, I think it boils down to weighing... a man who died against the man who was killed. A man I loved dearly. Against a man I disliked. And in the end, I can only do what I think is right. 